Johnny McGonigal, Bob Flounders, Blue White Breakdown. Thursday, getting close to Easter, Johnny. Happy Easter in advance. Uh, Going to talk some Penn State football. We were up at Penn State earlier this week. Some players made available. James Franklin made available. Tom Allen made available, the new D.C. Um, lots to get to. I know the Phillies are getting ready to open. I, I, they were going to open today. It's a Thursday, but I think they got rained out. So you're going to wait one more day, Johnny, one more day. But uh, let's talk. Let's talk some uh, Penn State football. Also, to the listeners uh, and the viewers who might have uh, might have been like, we're trying to remember our BYU pick from last week in the tournament. We're just going to brush that aside. We're going to brush that aside, and we're going to we're going to we're going to pretend that did not happen. Uh, they got Duquesne, I believe it was in the first round. So Johnny, good talking with you. I know what I want to talk about uh, after after uh, the practice that James talked about uh, after practice. I know what I want to talk about, but what do you want to talk about? But he said something. That really, really, really uh, gave me pause during uh, during the interview session. But maybe you didn't pick up on it. What do you want to talk about first? Bob, I don't want to talk about BYU. Okay. Uh, you know, they got damn broaded. And good for Duquesne. <laughs> good for Duquesne. You know, forget the BYU pick. I hope anyone listening to this podcast last week listened after that game happened. And so you didn't tail that. But I hope you did listen before the the Charleston Alabama game, and you yes, that, over over. That, was, that was the easiest smash of all time. Uh, I think I know what stood out to you, Bob. I yeah. think I actually peered across the scrum and even I saw. I dropped my head at one point and started just shaking it. It was about the wide receivers and the yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, yeah. So James said when he was asked about the receivers and. I think he was asked about Harrison Wallace specifically, or maybe it was when he was asked about Julian Fleming. I forget exactly. Yeah, it was Wallace. Wallace, yeah. He mentioned that he's looking for, like, out of the next group of wide receivers, you know, guys to separate themselves. And <laughs> it's like a broken record because this is this was the conversation and, and the, the, the tenor of the conversation that we experienced this time last year and, and really throughout uh, the 2023 season. And so – you hope, you know, it's March still, barely clinging on to March. We're heading into April soon. Uh, you know, you hope for Penn State's sake and Marcus Hagan's sake and everyone in that Lash building that some separation will come uh, via, you know, players stepping up and, and doing their job. Uh, but, yeah, I knew that stood out to you, Bob. Yeah, and before that, he talked a little bit about, uh, you know, Julian Fleming, and he talked very generally. And, I look, I get it. They've only had – it's only – two weeks into practice and I don't even know how much they've actually been able to do outside, whether it was the weather or they were indoors, but they haven't done much hitting or anything. They just got into live pads. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, 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 maybe James wasn't aware of what he said or, or the fact that he said it about a hundred times last year. And then we walked right into, uh, you know, them at Ohio state and then struggling so bad uh, against Michigan um, and he might have just kind of been on autopilot there because he he knew that there, there, not much had happened yet. But that to me is just until until either you and I see something or he says something that's different. Um, it's great that they have a new offensive coordinator, Andy Kotelnicki, who looks like he is definitely a take charge type on the practice field, and he's got some new ideas. And you can see when he was at Kansas. Uh, he was able to do some real interesting creative things uh, with his personnel. It's 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 all of that is nice, but until until one of those two, until several of those guys look like I don't know, I want to I don't know what year I would say, but I'm not, I'm not asking for Jahan Dotson, you know, 2021, but I, I'm just I'm I'm looking for somebody, a couple of guys that could scare the other team, that could take the top off of the defense, maybe. Um, that can run some solid routes and that can build a chemistry with the two quarterbacks, Drew Aller and Bo Prabula, because that's the other issue really is they got to step and take some pressure off Tyler Warren. They, they, the quarterbacks have to be able to trust the wideouts where they're going to be. They have to block better. They have to be able to get open. And eventually on third down, they've got to be able to make plays. And none of that really happened last year. And, and 
he had said pretty much all off season going into last year that uh, he would have liked for a couple more of them to separate. Harrison Wallace being healthy is going to help, right? But it, it's got to be more than that. And I just, I, I don't know. When I heard that, I thought literally we stepped back 12 months in time and I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. And you mentioned, I agree with everything you said. The one thing I'll add to that, to the wide receiver conversation, something that again, we've talked about uh, going over a year now, but coming out of the 2023 season, you know, these guys, the separation, the the miscommunications, everything uh, that kind of plagued this group and ultimately plagued the offense uh, last season. You, it really, you know, was on full display uh, during the biggest games of the year. Uh, you, you look at the Peach Bowl uh, against Ole Miss, wide receivers didn't have a catch until the fourth yeah. quarter. Uh, you look at the Ohio State and Michigan games, you know, the, the passing offense was a non-factor. And I think, you know, Caden Wallace had a touchdown catch at the very end of the Ohio State game that ultimately didn't matter because the game was already in hand. And yeah. uh, so you, you need guys like the Caden, you know, the Caden Saunders and, uh, and Omari Evans and, you know, Liam Clifford, uh, you need those guys to step up because you, I think you kind of know what you're going to get, uh, you know, from Keandre Lambert Smith. I think what he showed over what he's shown over the last couple of seasons is kind of his ceiling. He can make a big play for you, but I don't think he's a number one guy. Harrison Wallace, we didn't get to really see what his ceiling was last year uh, with the injuries that you mentioned and then Julian Fleming coming over from Ohio state. We know he's a talented guy, but he was, yeah, he was never the the guy uh, at Ohio State by virtue of being behind Marvin Harrison Jr., Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson. The list goes on. Uh, and so, yeah, it is early still, but the fact that we're hearing that, um, you know, right now, Bob, is it's just one of those where uh, if you've ever seen the gif of some some listeners may know what I'm talking about. It's of like a dog, like looking at cupcakes and then you start seeing like flashbacks and the dog looks like scared out of its mind. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google like dog cupcake gif. <laughs> it's like that. That's how I, I pictured you uh, when I saw you and your reaction was was yeah. like when James said that. So uh, great podcasting is telling people to go Google a gif. But here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try and focus on some other stuff and who knows maybe maybe James and and Penn State they're playing they're playing a little bit of possum early maybe. early in spring. I know I I know one thing Andy Kotelnicki is a confident guy and he still he still sounds very confident and we have to we have to let a lot of that stuff play out. There's going to be some different schemes. He's probably going to see the game hopefully a little bit differently than Mike Yersich did, but uh maybe maybe in the, maybe after coming Coming out of the blue white game, even though that's kind of a, a nothing, you know, there's not, not a lot's going to go on in that game. Maybe we're going to start to feel a little bit better after we see a couple of uh, practice sessions. But yeah, that was just something I was kind of hoping to not hear in late March, but we did. But what about let's let's go to some positives uh, for Penn State. Um, you know, they they have a, a really talented uh, young group of pl- of, of players. Tom Allen uh, was made available. Jalen Reed was made available. One of my favorite players to listen to and to watch play uh, was made available. Katron Allen was made available. I just think uh, I really en- I've re- enjoyed watching him play uh, since he's been at Penn State. Entering year three with Nick Singleton, you never know what he's going to say. He's a pretty honest guy, though. Um, I think he's going to have a big year. I'm hoping that Nick Singleton is a guy, maybe, Johnny, that if they can use him a little bit differently uh, than they did last year and maybe get him in space like he was able to do the last couple games of last year, that can certainly open up some things on offense. You talked to Katron Allen. Um, there was, I know there was a funny moment, I think. You, had, you almost had a one-on-one with him because people wanted to talk uh, uh, to the new D.C., I know there was a funny moment that you had with him, but what did you learn from Katron? He looks good. He looks he looks like he is uh, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. What did you learn from him? Yeah, the the funny moment you're referencing, Bob, and I told you immediately when mm-hmm. when all the interviews were wrapped up, and I ultimately didn't use it in the story that I wrote about Katron this week because yeah. you know it could be taken one or t- one of two sure. ways because he kind of followed up. I'll I'll just tell the story. So uh, there there was a question that was asked, you know the 
basically, can you explain the differences between Mike Yersich and Andy Kotelnicki? And when Mike Yersich was said, he kind of like smiled. He was like, who? Uh, <laughs> but then he followed it up with like, I didn't hear you. Like who? And, but you could kind of tell it was, it was not a, it was not an, I didn't hear you who it was like a, you know, like, who's that? Like, what do you like? That's behind us kind of thing. Um, and, and that was the, that was the, the rest of the interview from that point on talking about the offense and, what Kotal Nicky brings. He is really excited about it. And I think he even said, uh, we're trying to forget about the old thing and move on to the new thing. And, uh, you know, there was one little, and again, it's reading between the lines because, you know, Katron is an honest guy. A lot of these guys are, are well, uh, kind of well-oiled media machines at this yeah. point you know, with the training that they go through to, to really not say too much or not get too, um, you know, over the top or anything like that. Uh, and, and Katron wasn't, but the one thing that he did say that he said, you know, you get to do a lot of different things in this offense. You're not just standing in the backfield. You could be in the slot. You could be outside receiver. We can show our talents, which, you know, if you just look at it from a Kotelnicki standpoint, that's really good. It's good that he's confident. It's good that the offense and the players uh, in the system are already confident in what Kotelnicki can bring as a new offensive coordinator. But the way I read that quote was like, you know, we're not just standing in the backfield anymore. Like that's really what they were doing last year. Like they weren't used – as a receiver, both Katron and Nick, um, you know, probably as much as they could. Uh, that the fact that Katron said we can show our talents, uh, maybe he felt that over the last two years, especially last year when the going got tough and uh, in those big games, and they just got kind of straightforward and uninspired and lack cre- you know creativity, that maybe they weren't able to do that last year. So uh, I-, I do think that Katron is in for another big year, and Nick as well, as long as those guys stay healthy, because we've mentioned it. You know, they've had some really good injury luck at running back so far. You know, guys pick up the bumps and bruises as the season goes on, uh, but no major injuries for either of those two uh, bell cow backs for Penn State over the last two seasons. So, you know, Penn State fans will be knocking on wood that that stays the same and and we get to see them thrive in Andy uh, you know, in his scheme and whatever he's got cooking up for them. Yep. Uh, looking forward to seeing what Katron and Nick can do. Uh, this year, Johnny here on the blue white breakdown. It's not a, you know, we get, we get about a, what a 10 or 15 minute window to watch practice when we go up there. And then we get to talk to James and a couple of players and maybe uh, a key assistant coach. But when we're up there, you know, during my time, it's, it's never, it's not, you know, you you hear a lot of whistleblowing uh, during practice. It's usually, and it's usually to signify, uh, you know, the end of a play or to point something out or, you know, you know, James wants to make a point. This year, it's been a little bit weird. James talked about it. Tom Allen talked about it. James isn't the only one with the whistle. Tom Allen keeps blowing the whistle because he still thinks he's the Indiana head coach. Uh, it's been a he's been a, he was there for seven years. It's been a tough transition for him to not blow his whistle. That's something that's James's job. James joked about it. Tom Allen joked about it. But w- when James said he wanted a head coach of the offense, a head coach of the defense, a head coach of the special uh, teams. He certainly has one uh, in Tom Allen, the former Indiana head coach. Uh, He was made available. I talked to him. Um, You know, he won't, he won't be, he's not going to be exactly like Manny Diaz, but I always thought he knew his stuff. He knew his defensive stuff. He just never had the athletes to work with that, uh, he's had at Penn State. It's going to be a different, a little bit different looking Penn State defense. What I like about him is listen to the players talk about him and listen to him talk. Very much a believer in getting his best players on the field in position to make plays. And this year, I think one of the one of the strengths of Penn State's team is going to be. Um, it's safety group, and it could be the corner group again if some of these transfer pans, transfers pan out. But uh, it sounds like Tom Allen is a big believer uh, in extra DB sets, and I think we're going to see a lot of nickel defense this year, maybe even more than Manny did. And what that means is maybe just two linebackers on the field like you talked about last week. The change is it, won't, it might not be as many uh, – you know, nickels with three corners. It might be that extra DB might be a safety. He likes big athletes who can run. Penn State's got those. I think you're going to see that. Uh, Jalen Reed is a guy that I think could be the nickel guy this year. I think 
the fact that Zaki Wheatley is kind of took taking a step forward along with Kevin Whiston and they have King Mac has helped, but he is a guy that I think you're going to see. He's going to use his players a, a little bit differently than Manny did. I'm here for it. Um, I think he's going to get his best players on the field. Um, but I, I, I'm really curious to see how much different he's going to call defense compared to, to Manny. In the end, it's probably going to be the same. But he is a guy, I think, that's going to be a little bit different when it comes to getting his best players on the field. Yeah, I dig it, Bob. I dig it. The four two five. I'm I'm about it, especially if you're putting Jalen Reed in that position to be your, you know, insert cool nickname here. I think it might be the Lion for Penn it's the State. Lion, yeah. The Lion, yeah. You could call it a Rover. You call it whatever you want, but that guy who's kind of just causing confusion on the offensive side of the ball, uh, you know, getting after the quarterback, dropping back, doing whatever that needs to be done, um, you know, to to put your defense in in, in the best position. Uh, to succeed. And I agree with you on the safety position, not just Jalen Reed, but I was super impressed by KJ Winston last year. I mean, I thought by the end of the year, he was playing at an all big 10, possibly all American type of level, uh, the impact that he was making. Uh, Good to hear on Zaki Wheatley because, you know, he's been the the, the off season, you know, ball hawk guy. I think it was takeaway King, like those kind of, he's been, you know, you know, earning those labels, but last year, I don't think he made the impact that he right. would have wanted. And so, uh, you know, the fact that he is, you know, coming on strong this spring camp, if he can continue it through the summer and into August training camp, that'll be a good sign not only for him, but for the defense overall. You mentioned King Mack. I'll throw in Takari Nelson in there as well, okay. uh, who was a 2023 signee, super, you know, highly rated guy coming out of the South. And uh, I think that, you know, adding some weight that, that he, you know, could play a role for this defense as well. Uh, this upcoming season. And so it was interesting. One thing that, that James said, I, I do Bob want to get to something after this on something that James didn't say, Yeah, uh, but something that James said when he was asked about the linebackers, yeah. you know, and the movement of Abdul up to the line of scrimmage, that it does put some more pressure on, on the linebacker group that Abdul kind of leaves behind. And, uh, you know, Kobe King and, you know, Tony Rojas, we expect those two to be the starters, but then, mm-hmm. You know, beyond them, you got Dom DeLuca, you know, Tyler Elson is in the mix there. Uh, you got some younger guys, KP on keys, you know, Tamir Robinson, those guys as well. So um, it, it's interesting, you know, depending on how often Tom Allen uses the nickel, the four, two, five, like I think it'll be a lot. I think it will be more than Manny Diaz used. And that does put a little bit more pressure on those two linebackers because they don't got another guy aside of them. Yeah. Yeah. He did at the very kind of towards the end, he was talking about, yeah, he said he kind of couched it. He's like, you know, you know, they can kind of get used to the defense, grow into their roles. But we, when when August rolls around, we might put a priority on building some depth at linebacker because Abdul's at defensive end. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I felt the same way. I don't think they're worried about it because of the athletes that they have. It's just they have athletes maybe at linebacker that don't have a ton of ex- experience. But Tom Allen said it throughout his uh his, you know, 10 or 12 minutes with us that, Hey, it's a space game now. Right. And so you have to have your most, your most athletic guys with size on the field to try and match up with what the offense wants to do. The old big 10 isn't coming back. It's not, you know, most teams, especially with the PAC 12 schools coming in, most teams are not going to line up in a traditional set with two tight ends or a fullback or three tight ends you know, I don't even know if Wisconsin's going to do it anymore. So I think they see that coming and they're getting ready for it. And it should be interesting to see what they do uh, with linebackers, not only this year, but moving forward, right? What are the priorities? Um, how they'll maybe recruit hybrid athletes with, with that kind of defense in mind. But it was always going to happen. And I think James is a little James is a little concerned about linebacker depth, but Looking at Abdul Carter on the field, he de- he. I don't know about you, Johnny. He definitely looks like a defensive end to me now. A big athlete who can play up or down. But um, I don't. I think he's probably pretty happy that he doesn't really have to watch his weight anymore. He can, if he wants to play at two fifty five, he can. But he definitely looks to me like a guy that is ready to do some damage outside. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean we talked about this with with Abdul, like. We've seen him in whether it was the Prowler package, the, you know, the third down pass sets or him just blitzing. Like he has that knack uh, to rush the passer. He has a nose for the ball and he has the size, speed and ability that you want 
uh, and, and a top tier defensive end. And I, I do think he's going to provide that uh, for Penn State this upcoming fall. And it, it, I love the move for him. And I really think that, you know, opposites and I, Dennis Sutton, who I've been on all, you know, really for the last year, yeah. I, I do think that, you know, he's going to have a breakout season as well. And so uh, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, obviously rotating those guys, keeping them healthy, uh, you know, keeping them fresh, keeping the other guys satisfied as well, because there's some other talented defensive ends in that room too. Like Deion Barnes has a job on his hands. Like it is a, you know, it, it, it's tough replacing Chopper Robinson and Disa Isaac. Yeah, It's really like a, obviously a huge benefit to have athletes like Abdul and Denai in your room. Uh, but you've also got Zariah Fisher, who I thought played well last year. You've got Amin Vanover, who uh, made an impact in 2022 before injuries messed up his, his uh, season last year. Uh, and then Jamail Lyons, who uh, by all accounts after his freshman year, you know, showed a lot of flashes there, is ready to take uh, another step forward. And so – yeah, Deion Barnes, like he's got one of the, you know, obviously all these assistant coaches have have difficult jobs, you know, managing the rotations and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Deion Barnes has, has a tough one because he's, you know, you don't want to take Abdul Carter off the field ever, right? You're not going to want to take Deny Dennis Sutton off the field if he's playing at such a high level, but you also have to keep those guys behind them satisfied too. Yeah. Johnny, we're not done. I'm just going to tell the fans right now, we're not done with the NCAA tournament here. We're gonna we're gonna look for a little retribution, maybe. It, we're in the Sweet 16 round as we record this, but we're not we're not done with that. But I'm just I just want to we we started the podcast expressing maybe a little concern about the wideouts, and I think everyone, fans, other media members are all kind of just very curious to see what uh, you know what could happen with uh, in Andy Kolonicki's offense. What Marcus Higgins can do. I'm just gonna say that um, we've been wrong before, and maybe maybe James was just in autopilot there when he said that, and he wasn't trying. To me, uh, just wa- I mean, just watching it a little bit, and just watching it a little bit last year. A guy that I think in the wideout room. Obvi- let's hope let's hope that Julian Fleming um, can really impact that room. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a bigger receiver and I, they definitely need that. Uh, James is still counting on Harrison Wallace and maybe he can do that too. For me, for me though, um, you know, uh, to me, a guy that I think could really take a step forward. I still, I still have last year's blue white game, uh, on my radar and what Omari Evans did in that game. I know. I know that he was kind of given up on, I think the first two thirds of last season, I did think, um, there are moments down the stretch when they got rid of Mike Yersich that they tried to feature him and he made some plays. To me, he's a guy that if I'm Andy, Kot- Andy Kotelnicki, if I'm going to take a long look at a wideout in spring and in August and look at how he can run, he's, he's, he's gotten a little bit bigger. He's a guy that I would be watching, I think, between now and, and the time the season opens at West Virginia. I still think he's got another – you know, another gear in him is in terms of development. And I do think maybe if we're looking at the room and we're not talking about Julian or Keandre or Harrison Wallace, I still think he's a guy that has a chance um, to really help this team. Yeah, definitely. No, I, that, that's a good point. Um, and, uh, and, and one thing too, Bob, just before I forget, because I teased it a few minutes ago about something that James Franklin didn't say when we yeah. talked to him. And I, I just want to get to that real quick before we before we wrap up here at some point mm-hmm. soon um with with the quarterbacks so i know that we've talked about Aller a lot already this spring rightfully so we we talked about Bo Perbula and his potential role in Andy Kotelnicki's offense right, right i was curious about the young quarterbacks uh, about Ethan Gronkmeyer and about Jackson Smollick and so i asked James i didn't name those two but i said mm-hmm. you know how have you kind of taken, you know, or how have you seen the development and performance of your younger quarterbacks, you know, not only in spring, but in the winter as well, uh, kind of leaving it open for him. And he went on to mention that, you know, obviously Drew and Bo have a healthy competition. Uh, then he started to say that he was really pleased with what Ethan Grunkmeyer, <laughs> the 2024 early enrollee, four star consensus, elite 11 finalist. Uh, you know, that he's really happy with what Ethan Gronkmeyer has done uh, in spring camp. And and he went on a very long quote about that. And then that was it. He didn't mention Jackson Smollick. And it's noteworthy because Jackson Smollick, 
you know, and, and again, we don't see every practice and every minute of every practice, but the two media windows that has been open to us the last two weeks, Jackson Smollick hasn't been out there. Right. The, the redshirt freshman quarterback who, you know, saw the field in one game last year in the Delaware game, but he was all for, for all intents and purposes, the, the team's number three quarterback uh, last year. Uh, you know, so he hasn't been out there the last two weeks that, that we have been there now, like the transfer portal isn't open. So it's not like he's in that, uh, that won't open until April 15th. It might be an injury. Uh, James didn't say, but just something to put on, you know, the listeners, uh, and watchers on, on YouTube, the, you know, the, uh, you know, on their radar, you know, really, as we look ahead to the blue white game and, you know, keep, keep that in mind. If we don't see Jackson Smolik, you know, out on the field, whether he's on the sidelines or just not in Beaver stadium, just something to keep in mind. All right. I like it. I, I kind of noticed that too. We'll see. Sometimes, you know, last year there were some guys you didn't see a lot of. Uh, you, you didn't. It's, I guess what I'm saying is it's one thing to not see a veteran player um, at spring practice. Either maybe they had a surgery and they're just trying to get better, or maybe they're just, they know exactly what they have in that player and, you know, they're just kind of bringing them along slowly. I don't know, you know, he, you know, whatever, whatever the deal is with Jackson, he's a young player that is yeah. uh, clearly has not, he's done very little at Penn State in a room with, you know, Bo and Drew. So that, you know, did not see him. Um, eventually, eventually we'll see, we're going to either, we're going to see him or we won't. But I mean, it's this, this, there was going to be some clarity with that situation, I think, probably as spring uh, plays out. Speaking of clarity. Johnny McGonigal. It's the Sweet 16 round. People get in specifically, Johnny, Sweet 16 uh, brackets because their their original bracket is just shredded and they want something to do and something to maybe wager on the rest of the way. Everyone's kind of calling this now the Yukon Invitational. And it, it darn it, it might, it might very well be. That is that that team is looking very good. They're tested, they're experienced, they're deep. Uh, any, is there, is there anything, maybe anyone you're watching, not necessarily in the Thursday games, but to come out of the sweet 16 and challenge for the national championship at maybe a team other than UConn? I have a team I'm looking at, um, and we'll see how it plays out, but is there anyone that's kind of struck your fancy with 16 teams left? You mentioned the UConn invitational, like I, I have UConn. You know, winning it all as a lot of people do, and rightfully so. And uh, I, I had them winning last year when they were a four seed, and they—they're just, you know, they're so good. Um, I, I am, I am very intrigued by that game though that they have against San Diego State. You mm-hmm. know, a rematch from last year's uh, championship game. It's a, it's an eleven point spread, Bob, and you know, I had UConn minus fourteen against Northwestern, which did hit. Um, but boy, they were up by like 27 or 30 and then they just let Northwestern hang around. It turned out to be a sweat. So I'm probably staying away from that. But, you know, from a from a betting standpoint, from just a challenging UConn standpoint, uh, I do like North Carolina and I like Arizona. I, I think those two teams are bound to meet yeah. in the Elite Eight. Uh, Caleb Love, you know, former UNC guard going up against his old team. I believe that game would be played in L.A. So Hollywood script is it's kind of in on that. And, uh, you know, I love the way that both of those teams have played so far in this tournament. I'll be honest, I doubted UNC a bit. I had Michigan State beating them in the second round yeah. of the bracket. Um, maybe got it too infatuated by the Izzo and March vibes. But, uh, you know, both of them, you know, R.J. Davis against Caleb Love would be a phenomenal matchup. Uh, and whoever would win that game and potentially face UConn in the Final Four uh, I think could get it done. Although I, I, I do really love Tristan Newton and Castle and all those guys on UConn. Um, I'm still holding out on my Houston, uh, you know, national title futures bet that I, I placed like a month ago. Uh, but you know, they gave me a real scare against AM. So we'll see how the Cougs ultimately uh, pan out. You know, they play Duke on Friday night, so that's gonna be a hell of a game too. Yep. Uh, you, I, North Carolina is a team that I have circled as well because of what they did in the final 30 minutes of that game against Michigan State. I thought Michigan State, if you, if you anyone watched that game, Michigan State, the first 10 minutes, it looked like, uh, you know, a Tom Izzo team from about 10 years ago that just kind of took over in the tournament. They looked like they were in control of that game and they, 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 uh, 
North Carolina just wiped them out. I think North – so it's – yeah, hey, right, it's Thursday. This is probably not going to be a, uh, up in time. Any game – if Al- as long as Alabama is in the tournament, you want to bet the over in their games. I think it, it is North Carolina, Alabama. That's- yeah, they play They play uh, Thursday yeah. night So ho- at 9.50. So yeah. I think the podcast that's, will be out by then. That to me is uh, – So is, hopefully I, anyone I, listening – I think the number is 73. Don't, I wouldn't be too scared of that number. And once you see those guys play and you, you see the way that Alabama yeah. doesn't play defense, you're going to say, well, the pace will be right is what I'm going to say. And if North Carolina or whoever, if, if Arizona gets through and one of those teams gets through and meet each other, are they in the same – they're in the same region, right, Johnny? North Carolina, Arizona, yeah. Yeah, that game, I mean, can you imagine what that number is going to be? That that number will probably be like one, high 170s, early 180s. and I, it, can't, again, it can't be high enough. It can't be it, high enough. I, I don't think in this tournament you can be shot, as long as they're not in one of those football domes that affect the three. Um, overs have not been scarce so far. I, I just think it, it's been an entertaining tournament. The pace has been right. I don't think teams really care that much about defense this year. I don't know why that is. It might be. They haven't been together very long because of NIL, but I think I used to be scared of overs in this tournament, but now I'm the other way. Set set the number high, and as long as there's not a big lead at the end and you don't get dribbled out, I think the pace will be right. Especially yeah. if any of the you know, especially the games we just mentioned, North Carolina, Alabama, and then potentially Arizona, and the winner of that game. It could be Al. It could, if it's Alabama and Arizona. They might set that over at 194, and I'd go over that. So, <laughs> I, I I love I love the tournament. I'm with you on North Carolina. I'm a little intrigued by Marquette. That's a team that knows how to win close games too. They have a tournament coach, so we'll see how it goes. I'm I think I still believe UConn's going to get scared at least once in this tournament. Yeah, and we'll see if it happens this weekend, or they have to wait till the final four. Yeah, I was going to say you mentioned Marquette. One one play, you know. Listeners, take it or leave it. Fade me if you want. Take by it. All means, by all means, you know, do do what do what you will with this. But what I will be doing, uh, you know, is a North Carolina Marquette money line parlay. It's just over. It's into plus money. I love the NC State story. You know, DJ Burns is a hoss by every de- <laughs> by every like definition of hoss. He is a hoss, and I, I love him. Yeah. Uh, but I think NC State, like their magical run, I think ends with Marquette. And then I just like North Carolina to, to take care of business against Alabama. But like you mentioned, the Marquette NC State game might be tighter than the tighter than the spread. So if you just take those two teams money line, get a little just a little bit over even. I, I think it's worth it. Personal, right. personal. Fade me if you want. Fade me if you want. All right, Johnny, let's wrap this one up and let's hope let's hope next week or maybe in two weeks we, we get we hear James Franklin talk about wideouts finally starting to separate that's all i want for the that's all i want for easter you know some people have a christmas wish list johnny all i want for easter is for james franklin to say that a couple of wideouts have finally separated that's all you need bob that's all you need in life 